especially those four great beings who rule the quarters of the universe, Raphael, Mikael, Gabriel, and Oriel. But they had no place for the gods and goddesses of the ancient pagan religions they had conquered. And so the rabbis, the priests, and the imams practiced a sleight of hand trick and reclassified the homeless but not forgotten pagan deities as those same fallen angels who were already chained in deep pits at the ends of the earth. Thus, their greatest rival, the Canaanite thunder god, Prince Baal, became the demon Baal, first among the ranks of the fallen, who was said to appear as a cat, a toad, or a man, or all three at once, and to grant the power of invisibility. Prince Baal's beautiful consort, the goddess Astarte, queen of heaven, and mistress of the temple of love, was transformed into the demon Astaroth, described as a hurtful angel with bad breath, but who, when summoned, would reveal the true history of the fallen angels. And she certainly has fulfilled that promise. This prehistoric myth of the fallen angels laid the foundation for a Middle Eastern legend about the biblical King Solomon, who was said to have been the greatest magician of ancient times. According to our legend, Solomon, armed with the power of God's holy angels, bound and sealed those 72 rebellious spirits, or genie, into the brass vessel, from which he called them forth to do his bidding, even to assist him in building the great and holy temple at Jerusalem. But can our fantastic legend have any truth behind it? Are we really seeing these ancient gods and goddesses who became the fallen angels in the dark mirror in our magic triangle? Are the strange voices that speak through our lips during the magical channeling process really coming from these deities and demons of the dim past? Have we actually opened that lost portal between the worlds? And if so, can these powerful genie be commanded to reveal hidden knowledge and accomplish wonderful things? Well, the only way you're going to know for certain is to look into the dark mirror yourself. But I warn you, unless you take Solomon's magic very seriously, you should have nothing to do with these experiments. This ancient art is not a party game or a Halloween prank. There is no place in the magic circle for the dabbler or the thrill seeker. Every aspect of this system, spiritual, psychological, and technical, must be thoroughly understood before these experiments are undertaken. Like knights of olden times, magicians must be trained armed and armored before they go on a quest into the spirit realm. First you should know that the magic circle is your philosophical fortress when you open the gateway between the worlds. It represents the perfect circle of the vast universe and the unbroken boundary of your own being, which are one and the same when you practice Solomon's art, as above, so below, as within, so without. You should know that even back in ancient times, the triangle represented the philosophical first plane of manifestation. It acts as a cage containing and restraining the spirits you evoke. For the moment, let us imagine that we are participating in the original act of creation, back at the dawn of time, out in the vast reaches of cosmic space. First, we will create just one point. Next, we, or God, will establish a second point and connect it to the first so that we have a line. Then, when we plot our third point, we have our triangle, the first flat surface. Now, when we create point four, we have the first solid. We have created a thing. And, as long as we refrain from establishing point five, setting our thing in motion, we will constrain our creation to remain in its position, 
we will keep our spirit within the triangle. Traditionally, the name of the Archangel Michael, the Angel of Power, was separated into three syllables, M-I, C-H-A, E-L, and written in the corners of the triangle to add a visual emphasis to the symbolic geometry that bound the spirit. You must understand this concept thoroughly before you open Solomon's brass vessel and release the genie. It matters not whether you are a Christian, a Jew, a Muslim, or even a pagan. These archangels are very much a part of our Western tradition. They represent the positive forces that drive the engine of the universe and the love that holds it all together. In the order of the Temple of Astarte, we conceive and visualize them as complementary male and female beings. For angels can appear in any form they wish, or any suitable form that your imagination can provide for them. They activate your magic circle of protection. Casting your circle with a pentagram ritual before each operation is certainly important, but that alone is not enough. The great archangels must live in your mind and in your heart. You must have them inside as well as outside. Nosce te ipsum, en tuo templo tu es Deus. This is the very first time we have ever permitted cameras into the inner sanctum of the Order of the Temple of Astarte. Notice the names of the great archangels of the quarters in Phoenician around the magic circle. You will hear these same names invoked in the traditional pentagram ritual that precedes and follows every magical operation. But I say again, the pentagram ritual by itself is not enough. You have to have these four great archangels of the quarters indwelling within you and ready to help you control the rebellious spirits. Otherwise, opening the brass vessel would be like opening Pandora's box, which, according to the ancient Greek myth, released evil into the world and then could not be reclosed. Therefore, you must first master the art of angelic invocation before you proceed to its darker counterpart, the evocation of Solomon's 72 spirits. Along with the secret of the mirror in the triangle, the other crucially important element missing from the Galatian was the fact that the 72 spirits of the brass vessel had 72 direct counterparts in the holy angels of the Shemham Farash, or extended name of God. Now these derived or suffix angels are not as personified as the archangels of the quarters or the angels of the planetary spheres, but they do provide a direct channel of power through which the four archangels of the quarters control each and every one of the spirits of the brass vessel. Unless this concept is understood and integrated into your goetic operations, you are on spiritually dangerous ground. These Shemham Farash angels even have their own sigils, and there is a short invocation for each one of them. The careful operator should use both. And before anyone in the order of the Temple of Astarte is allowed to participate in goetic operations, we insist that they experience a series of four archangelic invocations. So how do we invoke the archangels? Well, there's another book in the Lamegaton Compendium that probably should have been published with the Goetia. It's called the Almadel of Solomon and gives us a very effective method for invoking.